Welcome back to the Joseph Carlson Show, everyone. In this episode, we have some breaking news. The famed short seller Hindenburg just released an extensive report, a short thesis on Block, the company formerly known as Square, the fintech company ran by Jack Dorsey. Now, this morning, the company's down around 11 to 12 percent on the announcement of this report. Anytime Hindenburg comes out with a report, stocks usually go down as a result. And this is on a day where everything else is going up like crazy. So some companies are up way big, but Block is down over 10 percent just because of the short seller thesis. Now, the title of this research report is Block, How Inflated User Metrics and Frictionless Fraud Facilitation Enabled Insiders to Cash Out Over $1 Billion. They packed a lot into the title, but as I've been reading through the report itself, there is so much more. This goes really deep. So in this episode, we're going to be going over all of it. I'll be dissecting it and going through and highlighting what I think are the most important parts of it. And we'll be going over whether or not these claims are being exaggerated or whether or not they appear to be accurate. So let's go ahead and dive in. We have a lot to get to. Now, before we even jump into the report, just a little background on Block the company. It was formerly known as Square. That's what it started off as, and they changed their name to Block later on. The ticker symbol for it remains SQ. Now, they got their start doing point of sale systems, the little dongles that you plug into iPads that you can run your cards. They were the first ones to really popularize that. That's the main product they sell. They also own Cash App, which is very similar to Venmo. And in a lot of ways, the company is often grouped in with PayPal, one of the two big fintech companies. So Block's a very popular company, very popular amongst retail investors. The stock has performed terribly over the past couple of years, even aside from being down 10% today. But that's what we're dealing with here. Now, the company was founded by Jack Dorsey, who, if I show you a picture of him, when I look at Jack Dorsey, doesn't that just instill a lot of trust? Isn't that what you think when you look at a guy like this, dressed in a tie-dye shirt with a Bitcoin background and a beard like Phil from Duck Dynasty? That's the guy that you want running your corporation and you want to trust with your deposits and your money. He's, he just has that, that look. Um, now, Jack Dorsey, if that doesn't instill enough trust just looking at him, he also has the reputation of running Twitter. How well ran was that company? Well, Elon Musk has fired over half the employees, about 75% of them, just to try to break even with the company. Anyways, let's go ahead and jump in to the actual report here and go over some of the highlights of it because this gets really juicy. At the top of the report of every Hindenburg research report, they have a summary of, of basically all their claims in it. And then they go through and it's just hundreds of pages of research that backs up all of their claims. So here are the claims and then the research is below. Now in this video, of course, we're not gonna be going through all of it. I've read through it, but I'm gonna highlight what I think is the most compelling parts of it. First of all, they say that this company has a $44 billion market cap and it claims to have developed frictionless and magical financial technology with a mission to empower the unbanked and the underbanked. So right there, obviously these are, th this right here, frictionless is a buzzword just means that, that you know you do things easier. That's used all the time. That's part of capitalism, making things have less friction. But magical is not really a buzzword I hear used that often. That's more of a little bit of a red flag there. Our two-year investigation has concluded that Block has systematically taken advantage of the demographics it claims to be helping. The magic behind Block's business has not been disruptive innovation, but rather the company's willingness to facilitate fraud against consumers and the government, avoid regulation, dress up predatory loans and fees as revolutionary technology, and mislead investors with inflated metrics. Right off the bat, I know that some of this stuff is true. When I look through here, the, the magic behind Block's business model, their company's willing to facilitate fraud against customers. I haven't done any research on this part, so I can't back this up. We'll look at the claims here. The government, avoid regulation. Again, I haven't done any research on this part. Dress up predatory loans and fees as revolutionary technology. Again, I haven't done any research on that part, but the mislead investors with inflated metrics is absolutely true. That's what basically all of these unprofitable companies, which Block is. It's an unprofitable company. That's what they all do. They try to inflate their metrics by doing adjusted metrics. If we bring up Block here, 
which again is ticker symbol SQ, and you can bring it up on Qualtrum.com. This website's available to Patreon members. But if we look at Block here, you can see the profitability or lack thereof of this $44 billion market cap company. So again, investors are paying right now $44 billion for this company. The company has a forward PE of 44, and those earnings are, are not trustworthy either. The free cash flow on a trailing 12-month basis is 0.02%, okay? 0.02% free cash flow yield. But this in and of itself overstates how much free cash flow they have. Because this would make you believe that they have a just a tiny bit, a smidge of positive free cash flow. This is actually wrong as well. If you adjust their free cash flow for how they pay their employees, it's heavily negative. Let's go ahead and bring it up here. This is what last year looks like when we add in stock-based compensation. Last year, they generated almost no free cash flow, $5 million, and they paid their employees over $1 billion in stock-based compensation. So the company basically is not profitable. And when you go to their actual earnings reports and you look at how they display their profitability metrics, they try to mislead investors. Plain and simple, they try to make it look like they're more profitable than they are. Now, I will give credit to Jack on one thing. In the last earnings report, or one of the earnings calls, he mentioned that a lot of investors were complaining about how they were displaying their profitability metrics. So they're going to try to incorporate stock-based compensation in it. They're going to try to make it more transparent. So he basically said, look, I see a lot of you have caught, caught on to this, right? A lot of investors are learning about this, right? I'm making a lot of noise here. A lot of people are making a lot of noise about it now. And we're going to try to be more transparent now. Well, that's after the fact. That is after a year of making the company look far more profitable than it actually is. It's down 70% over the past two years. So now they're starting to make things a little bit more transparent. But from this aspect, I can totally see and agree with Hindenburg Research here. Going on, they say our research involves dozens of interviews with former employees, partners, and industry experts, extensive reviews of regulatory and litigation records, and FOIA and public record requests. So basically, they're just saying we did our homework, which they do. Hindenburg Research really does their homework. I'm not saying that they're never wrong about anything. I think they do get it wrong sometimes. But overall, they have very good research to back up their theses and their, their basic accusations. Our research indicates, however, that Block has wildly overstated its genuine user counts and has understated its customer acquisition costs. Former employees estimate that around 40 to 75% of accounts they reviewed were fake. Huge claim here. And this comes from interviews of former employees. Hindenburg doesn't make this up. They do contact former employees. That's how they expose Nikola. They talked to former employees. Former employees filled them in on everything that was wrong that was going on. And that's what that's the whistle that was being blown. Former employees estimate that 40 to 75% of accounts they reviewed were fake. Over half of them. That's obviously a really big deal. That's something that investors aren't aware of at all. They were either fake or involved in fraud or were additional accounts tied to a single individual. Core to the issue is that Block has embraced one traditionally very underbanked segment of the population, criminals. The company's Wild West population, or sorry, Wild West approach to compliance made it easy for bad actors to mass create accounts for identity fraud and other scams, then extract stolen funds quickly. That's what I believe a lot of these companies are doing. Because Block really isn't a bank, but it's acting like a bank. And there's a lot of companies that are like these quasi banks that basically want to be a bank without the same regulations for knowing your user that a bank has. Even when users were caught engaging in fraud or other prohibited activity, Block blacklisted the account without banning the user. A former customer service rep shared screenshots showing how blacklisted accounts were regularly associated with dozens or hundreds of other active accounts suspected of fraud. This phenomenon of allowing blacklisted users was so common that rappers bragged about it in hip hop songs. That's a bit funny there. Block is in a lot of uh, hip hop songs, or at least Cash App is. Cash App's in a lot of hip hop songs. Uh, the Box is one of them, but it's, it's in a bunch of them. I've actually heard it. I've recognized the lyrics when I'm listening to different songs that they're referencing Cash App, which is kind of funny. But they do brag about being able to transfer money, 
basically without regulation. And here the big claim is, is when you find someone committing fraud, if you just ban their account without doing any type of ban associated with them as a user or their ID, you're basically just saying this account is banned, go ahead and make a new one. That does nothing. That is, it's, it's just uh, trying to give the image of doing regulation when you're not really regulating your platform at all. Block obfuscates. How many individuals are on the Cash App platform by reporting misleading transacting active metrics filled with fake and duplicate accounts? Block can and should clarify to investors an estimate on how many unique people actually use Cash App, unique users of the platform. If they did that, the numbers may fall down to 30% of what investors believe. So they don't want to do that. Now on this subject, I believe it. The reason that I believe that they do this, they try to exaggerate the amount of metrics they have of Cash App users, is because I've seen how much they try to exaggerate their profitability. If they're so eager to exaggerate their profitability to investors to make themselves look better than they actually are, then why would they not be equally eager to exaggerate and basically deceive investors with other important metrics of the company, like their cash app active users. So to me, I believe this. I think that they're doing this. I think it fits right in line with the type of leadership, the type of actions the company has done historically. CEO Jack Dorsey has publicly touted how cash app is mentioned in hundreds of hip hop songs as evidence of its mainstream appeal. A review of these songs shows that the artists are not generally rapping about Cash App's smooth user interface. Many describe using it to scam, traffic drugs, or even pay for murder. See our video uh, compilation list here. So he's bragging about it being mentioned, right? It's a popular app. And he's pointing out here that it's, it's popular, but for different things than it should be popular for. Quote, I pay them hitters on Cash App. Block paid to promote a video for a song called Cash App, which described paying contract killers through the app. The song's artists were later arrested for attempted murder. You can't make this up. The artists were literally arrested for attempted murder after it was mentioned in their app. This was the promotion they paid for. Cash App was also cited, quote, by far as the top app used in reported U.S. sex trafficking, According to a leading nonprofit organization, multiple departments of justice complaints outline how Cash App has been used to facilitate sex trafficking, including sex trafficking of minors. Now, I have a father that was in law enforcement for 33 years. One of the biggest challenges for criminals, in fact, it may be the biggest challenge ever to their operation and how the government can catch the majority of criminals is through money. It's through the movement of money. How they move around money is the most challenging part. And so anytime they can find a way of moving money that has less regulation, less tracking to it, less government surveillance, more vagueness, uh, you know, just easier to move money, criminals will automatically gravitate to that. That's what they'll go to. So if these claims are correct, this is a huge problem if you're an investor in block that's using Cash App. If this is being used as a a route to facilitate sex trafficking, that's obviously a huge claim. I don't have any research on this myself, but again, it all comes down to what's the easiest way for criminals to move money. Whatever they can move money from point A to point B without being tracked, that's what they're going to go to. Now there's even a gang named after Cash App. In 2021, Baltimore authorities charged members of the quote, Cash App gang with distribution of fentanyl in West Baltimore neighborhood according to the news report and criminal records. There is literally a gang named after Cash App. A gang named after it. Have you ever seen a gang named after Visa or MasterCard? We're the MasterCard gang. It does not have the same ring to it. So obviously criminals are using this in gangs, rappers, which are, are attempted murders in some cases, are using it in the lyrics of their songs. A lot of people that have criminal activity are using Cash App. Now, I look at this and part of it, I think, could be the name. It has cash in the name. Rappers like talking about money and cash. So I think that's part of the appeal. But I certainly believe there's, there's credibility to the claims that this is popular amongst criminals. They're citing a lot of information here that is unique to Cash App. I don't see these type of, these type of claims for other things. So moving on, they say beyond facilitating payment for criminal activity, the platform has been overrun with scam accounts and fake users.
according to the numbers of interviews with former employees. Now, I will say right off the bat, when I'm on social media, scam accounts and fake users are just everywhere. So I believe this, but I don't think this is such a unique problem right away. There are scammers everywhere. We have them on Discord, messaging Discord members of the Patreon. I have them on YouTube in the comment section. I'm constantly removing scammer uh, different comments all the time. I have them on Twitter following my Twitter users and trying to direct message them. They are everywhere. They're pests, they've, they've multiplied, they're on every social media. So it makes sense that they're also in the payment networks like, like Cash App. Examples of obvious distortions abound. Jack Dorsey has multiple fake accounts, including some that appear aimed at scamming Cash App users. Elon Musk and Donald Trump have dozens. To test this, we turned on our accounts into Donald Trump, or we actually, they say we turned our accounts into Donald Trump and Elon Musk and were easily able to send and receive money, we ordered a cash card under obviously fake Donald Trump account. Checking to see if Cash App's compliance would take issue, the card promptly arrived in the mail. So even though fake accounts create everywhere, there is a distinction to be made here. Companies that issue cards and have transfer of money should have a much higher standard for knowing who their user is than companies that simply say you can comment or you can message people. So on YouTube, there's fake accounts, but all they can basically do is just leave comments. That's not a lot of control. They can just leave comments and they, they try to scam people through the comment section. This is a financial app. You are making a new accounts, new accounts as President Donald Trump or Elon Musk and then you're getting cards issued to you. It didn't put up any red flags. So obviously, from this, they have no clue who their users are. No idea who their users are. Anybody can jump on and create an account, whether you're Donald Trump, Elon Musk, a uh, complete scammer, doesn't matter. You can get an account. Former employees described how Cash App suppresses internal concerns and ignores users' pleas for help as criminal activity and fraud ran rampant on its platform. This appears to be an effort to grow Cash App's user base by strategically disregarding anti-money laundering rules. And this is the next big claim they make, that Cash App is basically a laundry machine for criminals. They use this to launder money all the time. The COVID-19 pandemic and nationwide lockdowns posed an existential threat to Block's key driver of gross profit at the time, merchant services. Remember, their core business is point of sale services. When you go and swipe cards in person, that's what they did. Obviously, during COVID, you weren't doing anything in person, so their business had a tough time. In this environment, amid Cash App's anti-compliance free-for-all, the app facilitated a massive wave of government COVID relief payments. CEO Jack Dorsey tweeted that users could get government payments through Cash App immediately with no bank account needed due to its frictionless technology. Within weeks of Cash App accounts receiving their first government payments, states were seeking to claw back suspected fraudulent payments. Washington State wanted more than $200 million back from payment processors, while Arizona sought to recover $500 million, former employees told us. Once again, the signs were hard to miss, and you're going to want to listen to this part. Rapper Nuke Bizzle, you heard that right, Nuke Bizzle made a popular video about committing COVID fraud. Several weeks later, he was arrested and eventually convicted for committing COVID fraud fraud. These aren't the most intelligent artists of our day. Nuke Bizzle literally made a video bragging about committing a crime, exposing himself to committing the crime, and then he was arrested for committing the crime. Very interesting line of logic there. The only payment provider mentioned in the indictment was Cash App, which was used to facilitate the fraudulent payments. So obviously it's being used for COVID fraud. I think in their defense here, I think Cash App would say, yeah, there's some COVID fraud committed here, but COVID fraud was committed everywhere. I think that'd be their defense. But I would say it's probably a higher proportion to their user base of COVID fraud through the Cash App because, again, the lower amounts of regulation. We filed public record requests to learn more about Block's role in facilitating pandemic relief fraud and receiving answers from several states. Massachusetts sought to claw back 69,000 unemployment payments from Cash App's accounts just four months into the pandemic. Suspected transactions at Cash App's partner bank were disproportionate, exceeding major banks like JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, despite the latter banks having four to five times as many depositor accounts. So basically, what's happening here is even though JP Morgan is infinitively bigger than Cash App, they have a better grasp 
on their user, on their customer. That is inexcusable. To have a smaller user base and not even know who your users are, there's just no excuse for it. Now they go on to highlight how clearly disproportionate this is, referencing some data from Ohio. They say the data shows that compared to its Ohio competitor, Cash App's partner bank had nearly 10 times the number of applicants who applied for benefits through a bank account used by another claimant. A clear red flag for fraud. Block had obvious compliance lapses that made fraud easy, such as permitting single accounts to receive unemployment benefits on behalf of multiple individuals from various states and ineffective address verification. So you can create a Block account, you can go into their cash app, you can claim unemployment in multiple states and the app allows you to do that. In an apparent effort to preserve its growth engine, Cash App ignored internal employee concerns, along with warnings from Secret Service, US Department of Labor, OIG, FinCEN and state regulators, which have specifically flagged the issue of multiple COVID relief payments going to the same account as an obvious sign of fraud. Block reported a pandemic surge in user accounts and revenue. Ignoring the contribution of widespread fraudulent accounts and payments, the new business provided a sharp one-time increase in Block stock, which rose 639% in 18 months during the pandemic. So Hindenburg is arguing that this massive rise in stock price, 639% gains in 18 months, was mostly a result of fraudulent activities. Facilitating fraud is what got the stock to go as far as it did, to go up to a $100 billion market cap company. And that's where we are so far. We're not even through this report. We still have a ways to go. And again, just I just have to say, it's so disappointing when I look at all of this and I think, how could this happen under the leadership of Jack Dorsey? How is this possible? I, I could just never imagine a guy like this having such a terrible operation like this. It doesn't make any sense. Let's go ahead and continue on here. We get to the next phase of their research where they say that they're arguing that basically the insiders facilitated this fraud. And then of course the insiders, Jack Dorsey and others benefited from the fraud. And they explain how they benefited. As the stock soared on the back of its facilitation of fraud, co-founders Jack Dorsey and James McKelvey collectively sold over $1 billion a stock during the pandemic. Other executives, including the CFO, the lead manager for Cash App, Brian, also dumped millions of dollars in stock. So basically, they pumped the stock by facilitating a lot of fraud. Once the stock rose nearly 700%, they dumped the stock amidst everyone else buying their lies. With its influx of pandemic Cash App users, our research shows that Block has quietly fueled its profitability by avoiding a key banking regulation meant to protect merchants. Interchange fees are fees charged to merchants for accepting use of various payment cards. Congress passed a law that legally caps interchange fees charged by large banks that have over 10 billion in assets. Despite having 31 billion in assets, Block avoided these regulations by routing payments through a small bank and gouging merchants with elevated fees. That is true. They, they did pass, uh, pass a law. It was actually called the, I believe, the Durbin Act. And this was supposed to have a big impact on Visa and MasterCard. Obviously, they've done well, but they have to abide by these interchange fee regulations. They're capped on how much they can charge. And what they're stating Block is doing here is basically avoiding that limitation so that they have an unfair advantage over the other big players, over Visa, MasterCard, and bank issuers. So they're routing the, the payments through a small bank and gouging merchants with elevated fees. Block includes only a single vague reference in its filing acknowledging it earns revenue from interchange fees. It has never revealed the full economics of this category, yet roughly one third of Cash App's revenue came from this opaque source, according to a 2022 Credit Suisse research report. That's incredible to me. It makes up a third of their revenue and they have one line associated to that form of revenue obviously means they don't want too much attention drawn to this form of revenue. Competitor PayPal has disclosed it is under investigation by both the SEC and CFPB over its similar use of small banks to avoid interchange fee caps. A Freedom of Information Act request was filed with the SEC indicates that Block may be part of a similar investigation. So that's incredible. They're under investigation. I guarantee you most investors in this company have no clue that they're under investigation for this. And if they're regulated, this could drop a huge portion of, of Cash App's revenue. 
a major part of it. One third of the revenue coming from interchange fees. They have to lower their interchange fees and play by the same rules everyone else is. That would drop their overall revenue. If they have to pay fees associated with obfuscating this and lying about it and not following the, the rules, obviously that would be a one-time hit as well. Now, moving on from this, we get into one of their acquisitions. Block purchased Afterpay, the buy now, pay later firm for $29 billion. So a massive deal for Block, and they highlight some problems with this acquisition. Afterpay was designed in a way that avoided responsible lending rules in its native Australia, extending a form of credit to users without income verification or credit checks. The service doesn't technically charge interest, but late fees can reach APR equivalents as high as 289%. The acquisition is flopping. In 2022, the year after pay was acquired, it lost $357 million, accelerating from its 2021 losses of $184 million. Fitch Rating reported that after pay delinquencies through March 2022 had more than doubled to 4.1% from 1.7% in June of 2021, just prior to the announcement of the acquisition. Total processing volume declined 4.8% from the previous year. Now, they also go on to say how Block will hype things that other competitors have, but even cheaper. They say Block regularly hypes other mundane predatory sources of revenue as technological breakthroughs. Roughly 31% of Cash App's revenue comes from instant deposits, which Block says it pioneered and works as if by magic. Every other competitor we checked provides a similar service at comparable or better rates. So that's not necessarily illegal by any means, but they're just hyping something that should not be hyped because every competitor has it. Now, finally, we get into a part of their analysis here that has to do simply with evaluation. This is their thesis on why the company deserves to drop substantially. On a purely fundamental basis, even before factoring in our findings of this investigation, we see downside of nearly 65 to 75% in Block's shares. Block reported a 1% year-over-year revenue downside from 2022, which is incredible. This high growth company just had revenue declines. Other companies in my portfolio, Texas Roadhouse, Costco, uh, many other companies, they have been growing revenue. But, but Block, this is the growth company that's highly valued as a growth company. Block reported a 1% decline in revenue growth and gap loss of 540.7 million in 2022. Analysts have future expectations of gap unprofitability and the company has warned it may not be profitable. Despite this, Block is valued like a profitable growth company. With an EV to EBITDA, enterprise value to EBITDA multiple of 60 times 2023 numbers, an adjusted earnings multiple of 41 times, and a price to tangible book ratio of 13.1, all wildly out of line with fintech pairs. Despite its current rich multiples, Block is also facing the threat from key competitors like Zelle, Venmo, PayPal, and fast-growing payment solutions from smartphone powerhouses like Apple and Google. Apple has grown Apple Pay activations from 20% in 2017 to 17% or to 70% in 2022, and now leads in digital wallet market share. And one thing I'd also say is that the customers Apple has are actually real. That's a Another important distinction between Apple and Block is when Apple actually has customers, they're real customers. They're not, uh, it's not one person making 5,000 accounts. And then finally, they say, in sum, we think Block has misled investors on key metrics and embraced predatory offerings and compliance worst practices in order to fuel growth and profit from facilitation of fraud against consumers and the government. We also believe that Jack Dorsey has built an empire and amassed $5 billion in personal fortune, professing to care deeply about the demographics he is taking advantage of. With Dorsey and top executives already having sold over $1 billion in equity on Block's meteoric pandemic rise. They have ensured they will be fine regardless of the outcome for everyone else. Now that is the summary. Yes, just the summary of their case against Block. And for every one of these, these summary points, they have pages of in-depth research, reports, sources, everything to back up the claim. So you can go ahead and read through the entire report if you want. I think it's very extensive. I think they make very solid arguments. And I agree with the claim that the company probably has another 60 to 70% to fall from here. You look at just the fundamentals. And even again, like they say, outside of all of the fraud and all of the potential issues and the investigations, outside of that, just on a clear valuation scale, it probably should fall another 60 or 70%. Look at the free cash flow yield. 
Look at the revenue growth of the company. It has complete deceleration in its revenue despite trying to acquire companies to grow. So they have barely any revenue growth right now. They have no free cash flow. They have a company where their expenses and insiders are making money through stock-based comp. They have share count going up over time, expenses rising far faster than revenue. This company basically has everything that I don't like to see in a company. I would never invest in a company like this just based off the fundamentals. So I think that this is a very solid bear thesis from Hindenburg. And this is why I don't like to bash short sellers. Some of them, like Hindenburg Research, do phenomenal work. They actually come up with a lot of data. Again, I don't agree with everything that they ever say. Sometimes they'll get it wrong. Sometimes I'll disagree and I'll see that they're trying to push things a little bit. But I think overall, this type of research would not happen without some type of financial motive. So even though Hindenburg is going to profit off of this short thesis and coming out with this paper, I think they should. If they had no reputation of actually having validity to their research, they wouldn't be able to move the stock. So the fact that they are able to move the stock shows that their research historically has been proven out. It bears out. The last thing that I'll mention on this is a notable block enthusiast and investor that invests in disruptive and innovative companies. We can't forget about Kathy Wood and ARK Innovation. They have block right there as the fifth largest holding with a 6.24% stake in it. Kathy knows how to pick them. But overall, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of the short thesis on Block. Let me know if you agree or disagree with Hindenburg. And if you are invested in Block, let me know what you think. I'd be interested to know if this changes your mind on anything. That's all for now. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. And if you haven't already, also check out the Patreon. I think you'll have a lot of fun. Other than that, I'll see you in the next one.